milli, micro, nano, milli, micro, nano, milli, micro, nano, milli, micro, nano. When people think about a short period of time, it's usually in seconds or maybe even tenths of seconds. We use electronic clocks to help us count hundreds or even thousands of a second. Computers? They live in time well beyond the decimal point. Let's get rid of the minute 17 here, and we are left with 769 milliseconds. You will see this abbreviated as MS. 1000 milliseconds is one second. That is the time frame you think about when you have to deal with people or physical devices. However, in dealing with electronics, you need more precision. Let's add three more decimal places. This is 769,000 microseconds, which we abbreviate mu s. There are 1 million microseconds in each second. Most electronics that we work with live in this time frame. When we talk about clock cycles on a CPU, we need more resolution. Now we have 769 million nanoseconds. We abbreviate that NS. There are 1 billion nanoseconds in one second. To give you a sense of scale, you'll remember from school that in one nanosecond, light travels about one foot in a vacuum. Why they put it in a vacuum, I don't know. One morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I don't know. In order to deal with these time scales, smart electronics use computers called microcontrollers. Microcontrollers offer a complete computer in a small, inexpensive, and power-efficient package. For example, a microcontroller in a computer keyboard scans the keys, debounces button presses, and converts the key press into a scan code. The scan code is then sent to another computer through a wire or over a radio. Microcontrollers are single tasking. There is no operating system, and they usually cost less than a couple of dollars. For a long time, microcontroller chips were inexpensive. However, development systems for the chips were usually thousands of dollars. This changed around the turn of the century when a group of Italian students created an open source project which eventually turned into Arduino. Arduino began by offering an open source 8-bit microcontroller dev board. More importantly, the software development system offered was a software IDE that runs cross-platform. The idea caught on like wildfire. As time went on, microcontroller hardware became more powerful. People started programming them in different languages, most notably Python. The chip manufacturers, like Atmel and ST Microelectronics, standardized on 32-bit designs built around the ARM Cortex architecture. In fact, the newer Jetson Xavier and Orin also have ARM Cortex cores to support the SPE. A new player in the game is the Raspberry Pi Foundation. The new chip is called the RP2040, and the development board is the Pico. Being an education company, the Pico is beyond well documented. For an extra buck, you can get one with pre-soldered headers. Two bucks will get you wireless capabilities. The hardware itself is mostly entry level, but has some novel features worth exploring. The RP2040 has a C, C++ SDK, and also supports MicroPython. Third party support has sprung up around the Pico. This includes the Arduino IDE, Visual Studio Code with the Platform I.O. extension, and CircuitPython, to name just a few. Documentation for the Raspberry Pi Pico is extensive. Let's wander over to the Pico webpage. Scrolling down the page, we can see the pinouts. For example, on the Pico, the LED is GP25. Let's scroll to the top of the document. Clicking on the hamburger menu, you get a table of contents. Let's install MicroPython. Let's download the MicroPython UF2 file. You can think of this file as the personality core for the language that you are using. There are UF2 files for C, C++, Arduino, MicroPython, CircuitPython, and so on. Let's open up the download folder. There is our UF2 file. Let's prepare our Pico. Press the boot select button, plug in the micro USB cable, the other end is connected to the Jetson, and then release the button. The Pico mounts as a mass storage device. We will see it on the Jetson as a separate drive. Now we drag and drop the MicroPython UF2 file onto the Pico drive. The Pico reboots. Now it's running MicroPython. You can no longer see it as a mass storage device. Let's scroll down the page a mite. Here's a link to the Raspberry Pi Pico Python SDK book. Consider reading it if you want to learn some secrets. Thani is the recommended IDE for MicroPython. Let's install it on our Jetson. 
On the Jetson Hacks account on GitHub, there is a repository named install Thani. Here there is a shell script named install Thani. Let's take a look at the script. The first command adds ourselves to the dialout group. That gives us permissions to communicate with USB devices. Coincidentally, we communicate with the Pico as a USB device. We are going to use pip for the installation. We need a newer version of pip than the one that is located in the Ubuntu repository for this Python release. This means that we need to install Python 3.7. Then we'll create a Python virtual environment and then switch over to that directory. Next, we install an upgraded version of pip. Finally, we install Thani using pip. Let's clone the repository. and switch over to that repository's directory. Now we run our script. Password. Installation complete. We need to reboot for the changes to take effect. Let's do that real quick. Be right back. Now let's install some MicroPython Pico examples. On the Raspberry Pi account on GitHub, there is a repository named pico-micropython-examples. Let's clone that repository. Let's clear this off. Next, we'll source our Python environment we set up. Plug in our Pico. It shows up as a USB mass storage device. And now we are ready to run Thani. Let's go. Let's click down here in the bottom right hand corner and we are going to select a micro Python for the Raspberry Pi Pico. This is a new Pico. There is no additional firmware installed. There are a couple of ways you can install MicroPython. We can allow Thani to do it. Let's go over that real quick. We have already plugged in our Pico. Let's click install. Now we see the familiar Python REPL prompt. Let's tell it to print hello there. Hello there. Let's open up a file browser. Here we can see the files that are on the Jetson and the files that are on the Pico. For hardware, blinking an LED is the software hello world. Let's go full screen mode and take a look to see what the instructions have to say for themselves. Section 2.5. Blink in LED. Let's hack those commands in through the console. We'll import the pin, create the LED pin, and set the value of the pin to one. That's not quite right. Oh, the value must be a function, not an attribute. Green light, go. Now let's turn the LED off. Let's turn this into a little script to flash the LED. We'll define our pin and we're going to import time. And then forever and ever, amen, we will run this little loop. We'll light up our LED. We'll sleep for about 500 milliseconds, turn the pin off and then sleep a little bit more. Click the button to run the current script. Let's save the script to the Pico. Let's give it a name. Something clever. Blink test.py. No blinky. Let's see. Oh, there's a typo. Let's try it again. Save and run. There we go. I am a golden god! Blink all day, blink all night. Let's go over to the MicroPython examples we downloaded. We'll open up the Blink folder, blink.py. Let's try running this one. It blinks too. 
This example is a little more sophisticated. It uses a callback timer and the callback timer toggles the LED. We can stop our script by clicking the stop button. Let's copy our script from the Jetson to the Pico. We will upload it to the root. You'll need to be a little bit careful here. It's sometimes difficult to tell where the files in the editor are stored. Make sure you're working with the one on the correct device. Let's wander down to the PWM example. Open that up. Let's open up the file. Let's run it. You can see that the LED intensity brightness changes. Just another success. Then for our final trick, let's run a PIO example. PIO is a state machine with a limited set of instructions. These state machines run independent of the CPU. The code is very close to that of assembly language. MicroPython puts a wrapper around the state machine instructions. Then we set up the state machine. We point it to blink. We set a frequency for the clock and assign the pin that the state machine will run on. Then we activate the state machine, tell the CPU to sleep three seconds, and then we turn off the state machine. Let's give it a go. Wow, success yet again. You can see this is very low level and therefore very powerful. It'll be fun to explore this. In order to erase everything on the Pico, in essence a factory reset, we flash it with a special UF2 file. There is a link to the UF2 file on the Pico documentation webpage. I will leave a link to that section in the description below. Let's download the UF2 file. Next, we unplug the Pico, press the boot select button, and replug the Pico USB cable. The Pico will show up as a mass storage device. We drag and drop flash nuke onto the Pico. The Pico reboots, and now we have a clean machine.